And so it is very appropriate for us as we dig into the book of 1 Peter together again today. So welcome. Um, I've titled this Trust and Obey, and we'll get into that and see why that is the case. Let's have a look at the passage. We'll read it together. Peter 1, 1 Peter 10 to 21. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, so also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So I want us to consider one of the words that is repeated in these passages, and that's the book of Revelation. The word revelation means unveiling. And we quite often think of unveiling in terms of maybe something like a statue or a new motor car. So when a new motor car is unveiled, initially it is going to be covered with a big cloth so that you can't see the details. Now in this day and age, we all have a general idea of what a car is going to look like. It's going to have four wheels and it's going to have a bonnet and a boot and um, that's about as far as my interest in cars goes. (laughs) So, but it's very exciting for some people when a new model comes out because it's in the details that the interest lies now because that's where the uniqueness is. So we went off to the museum. This is not a new car, but at the time it was very, very new. We went to the museum in, where's my picture? I'm going backwards or forwards. I have a big picture to show you. Gosh, I don't see it here at all. (laughs) It's not there. Okay. It was a very flash BMW. (laughs) It was at the Auckland Museum, and um, the doors weren't even like the normal doors because the doors actually opened up the side. And I don't think many of them ever made it onto the streets of Auckland, but it was exciting to see in person this car and to see it revealed. So that was about 11 years ago. Um... But what does that do have to do with how we know God? I actually don't think these slides are the full set of slides at all. So I think Bob is going to plug in my laptop and show them. So that would help me in what I'm going to say. So we might just wait a moment to see if we can get all the slides. Am I right, Bob? I can't even see him. Oh, he's going to get it out of the car. Okay. (laughs) We brought my laptop as a backup. This is my worst nightmare realized. The very thing I was dreading, and no one said it would go that wrong, has gone wrong. (laughs) All right. So what does flashy cars and revelation have to do with this passage in 1 Peter? And it is really in relation to the biggest question we as human beings can ask, and that is, how can we know God? That is the most profound question for human beings. 
And down through the ages, we've come up with various ways. One of the ways is through reason. The Greeks in particular, in their philosophy, Aristotle, who was the f known as the father of logic, he employed reason to try to understand who God is. He talked about the uncaused first cause. And since then, philosophers have progressed in their thinking along those lines. So reason is one of the ways in which human beings have come to try to come to an understanding and knowledge of God. Another way is through tradition. In the Western world, there were traditions um, throughout the Middle Ages, uh, religious traditions. The Jews had traditions that they added to their, um, the law and prophets that ways for them to approach God to come to know him. In other cultures, in Asia and Africa, all cultures have had traditional ways of trying to understand who God is. And then the third way that human beings try to understand and know God is through experience. Um, Buddhism would be one of those ways and most modern spirituality. But those three approaches to God never reach God because God is other than us. He is transcendent and we are human. And so what we need to be able to understand God is revelation. And that revelation comes from God to us. We would never work out God in our own way. Um, Karl Barth said, God reveals himself as Lord. And that is the only way we can know who God is. He's given us general revelation in creation. So we can see his eternal qualities and his power and majesty through creation. And then he's given us specific crea uh, revelation in the word. And we have both the written word and the living word in Jesus. So revelation is by definition from the top down. And in this passage, we see the revelation with the word revelation or its or synonyms for it repeated five times in the first 20 verses of this letter to Peter. There's the flash car. Thank you. And there's a flash kid. It was 11 years ago. So I really don't know how many of those cars ever made it onto the streets of Auckland. Um, right. So how can we know God? Thank you. So there's my diagram showing God is other to, from humanity. And man tries to reach God and understand God through reason, through tradition, through experience. But they are all inadequate, totally inadequate. And then God is the one who has revealed himself in unquestionable and ways. So... <clears throat> Let's have a look at the five instances of the word revelation in our passage. All right. So I've already we mentioned those. I won't go over them again. Huh? So in verse 5, Peter says, You who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 7. Your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you. This was the prophets. And we are to set our hope fully on the, the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then verse 20, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times, which would be the same thing as revelation being dis displayed. So the, as you can tell with this, revelation actually requires a response. It is so overwhelming, so dramatic, so extreme that God would reveal himself in that way. We can't just sit back and say as human beings, oh, well, that's an interesting thought to add to our philosophy. Let's add a little bit to our tradition. Um, maybe we can experience this God a bit more. It's, it's much bigger than that. And so that response is that we have to choose. Are we going to trust in that revelation? And, and then are we going to obey it? Are we going to live our lives in the light of this revelation? There is a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. And this difference is trusting and obeying. The two go hand in hand. If we don't obey, it is because we don't really trust God. And if we don't trust him, we won't obey him. 
So Peter, in his greetings to these Gentile believers uh, in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, he acknowledges that they have trusted and obeyed God for salvation and sanctification in the Spirit. So these believers have done it. And now in verse 10, he goes on to talk about the salvation. So in verses 10 and 11, the prophets who were prophesying couldn't understand exactly when Jesus would be returning, although they were doing it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Then they also couldn't entirely reconcile the idea of the Messiah who would be a suffering Messiah. They prophesied that Jesus would be glorified. They prophesied that he would suffer. But deep down, the Jews were longing for a triumphant Messiah. And so the prophets couldn't fully understand what they were predicting. And even the angels in verse 12, they were longing to get to look at this marvelous salvation. So they didn't know when Jesus would be coming, and they couldn't understand it all. But this was what was revealed to us. Jesus' disciples, while they were living with him and walking with him, they couldn't grasp this full concept of Jesus and his messiahship. They hoped he would overthrow the Roman oppressors and reign as king of Israel. And Peter himself, who's writing this letter, only fully understood this at Pentecost when he was filled with the Spirit. And then he preached what Jesus' purpose was, how he had to come and suffer and die and then rise again, and how he would be coming back. So we come to verse 13, which says, Therefore, which is the pivot, in the light of this amazing salvation that Peter has described in his first 12 verses, he's saying, well, you are to think clearly, he's saying to these Gentile believers, think clearly and be self-controlled. You are to set your hope fully, and the hope is a synonym for trust. Set your hope fully on the salvation that will be brought when Jesus is revealed. This set is an active word. They are to choose what they trust in. In our world, we're told to trust in ourselves. Back yourself. Um, but this is not what uh, Peter is saying. He's saying, set your hope fully on Jesus when he is to be revealed. God's elect are to think soberly and to choose carefully to trust Jesus' return. Verse 14, these believers now have a new family. They grew up, they grew up in a pagan, um, in a Roman empire. And so now they've been chosen by God and are part of his family. They have a new identity. And so now they are children of God. And there's a whole new way of thinking about them. And he goes on to tell them how they are to live. Verse 16. But he who called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And here Peter quotes from the Old Testament. In his letter to the, um, the, these Gentile believers, he has 105 verses, and 20 of them refer to the Old Testament. These Gentile believers didn't have the history and the understanding that Jewish believers had. And so Peter's referring them backwards and forwards to the Old Testament. This quote comes from Leviticus 19 verse 2, where God is addressing Moses and giving them instructions for the Israelites, telling them before that they are not to be like the Egyptians, and to worship the Egyptian gods, who, who's, and they're fleeing from Egypt, and they are not to be like the Canaanites and worship their gods when they enter their land. Instead, they are to be holy because God himself is holy. No man-made religion comes up with a holy God. This is God who has revealed himself to us. To be holy is to be set apart or distinct in a moral sense. God is the essence of holiness because he is completely separate from all evil and impurity. So God has always called his people to holiness right from the beginning as he was setting aside those, um, the Hebrews to be his own people. 
And now as he's building for himself the church, he calls them to be holy. So that is part of the process of sanctification. And Peter talks about the fact that we are, uh, the believers are saved for sanctification in verse 2. That's the only time, that's the first time he's used the word. But holiness, the process of becoming holy, is a process of sanctification. From the moment we receive Christ, we have been made holy positionally. As we walk with him, we are being made holy. And we will be holy when he returns. When we see him, we will be like him. And that process will be finally complete. Here's a rough explanation or definition of sanctification. The Holy Spirit has not only set us free from sin, but also lives in our hearts and empowers us to follow Jesus more closely. As we daily follow Jesus, turning away from sin and towards God in obedience, the Holy Spirit produces in us Christ-likeness. The Christian life isn't difficult to live. It's impossible. And the only person who lived it was Jesus. And he has promised to live it in and through us by the power of his spirit. So this supernatural life is interesting because if I think of Jesus walking on those dusty streets in Galilee, he didn't hover 10 centimeters above the ground. He walked. He got blisters. His feet were dirty. He sweated. He got tired. And so human holy life is very ordinary. And yet he was obedient to the Father, and he was without sin. But obedience alone cannot make us holy. The Pharisees added all those rules as a way of making themselves better than the others. I don't even know if they believed entirely that they were holy. But that in itself was never enough. And so this is a work of God. It is a miracle. Now, by contrast, I thought it would just be interesting to see what Toza says about who God is or the way we worship him. He said, the history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion. And man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Last week, Hayden described the extent of the debauchery that was widely practiced in the Roman Empire. There was no restraint. The gods of Greek and Roman mythology were made in the image of the people who had invented them. And in turn, the behavior of those who worshipped these gods then reflected the behavior of the gods. But God, who has revealed himself as holy, he's asking us to be holy, distinct and set apart. And so whether or not this is entirely true that this is a very profound comment by Toza and I think if we think of the Egyptians and their gods and the way they lived and the Canaanites and the Romans there certainly was evidence of this that people did not rise above their concept of the deities they were worshipping coming back to Peter's letter in verse 17 he's telling the Gentile believers to conduct themselves with fear I just switched that off. I meant to go back. There we go. Um, we, are to have, we are to be fearful of God, to live with a holy reverence and awe for God, not a paralyzing fear. But it is to live like exiles in um, a foreign land. Why? Why are we to fear God? All along, Jesus said, do not fear. It's his most oft-repeated commandment. Do not fear. Well, if we fear God, we don't need to fear anyone else. Um, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. But why do we need to live life, holy lives? Why fear God? And that is because in verse 18, we have been ransomed. And this is what we've been ransomed from, an empty way of life handed down from us. Any culture in and of itself does not offer us what Jesus offers. And they'll form part of any culture that will be 
completely empty and devoid of value. Part of any culture also will be neutral and part of every culture will be God honoring. But we want to live for God because we've been ransomed by the precious blood of Jesus. We've been ransomed for the gracious inheritance that is to come. And we've been ransomed by Jesus whom God chose before the world began. So it is in the light of this great inheritance and this great revelation from God and what he has done in and through Christ that we are to live holy lives. Verse 20 says that Jesus was made manifest for the sake of these Gentiles and for us so that our faith and hope would be in God. Now verse 13 and verse 20 talk about hope. And holiness is contained between those two. It is we live holy lives because of this incredible hope that we have that Jesus will return and that he will restore all things. So in conclusion, our challenge is to trust and obey. What does it mean to hope in our future inheritance? Is it a passive sort of wishful thinking, pie in the sky when we die? No, it's an active, determined, setting our hope fully on the promise of that glorious inheritance. To hope or trust in this inheritance is to live our lives in the light of that reality. We are to order our priorities and values according to God's kingdom. We are not to just fit in with the culture that we find ourselves in. We need to live holy lives in a world where evil has been declared good, just like these first century Christians that Peter is writing to. We are to keep turning away from ourselves or trusting and hoping in ourselves and instead turn towards Jesus and trust and hope in him. And we, we are to obey him, to live holy lives, so this glorious inheritance that is our inher that has been promised to us, that is absolutely certain, is what inspires us and prompts us to live obedient lives to glorify God. Let me close in prayer for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great salvation and for the future completion of it that we long for and yearn for even creation groans waiting for redemption and so lord as certain as your first coming was your second coming is just as certain and help us as we live as exiles in between to live holy lives to turn away from our sin to turn towards you to trust you to produce Christ-likeness in our hearts. So help us today as we face whatever the situation and circumstances of our lives is, that we would choose to trust you and to obey you. In Jesus' name, amen.